My name is Christina Crook, and I am the author of The Joy of Missing Out. I want to welcome you to the JomoCast, a podcast for individuals who want to learn how to thrive in a digital age. Jomo is the joy of missing out on the right things, things like toxic hustle, comparison, and digital drain to make space for life-giving commitments to people and work that bring us peace, meaning, and joy. Self-love. It sounds a little like self-care, self-esteem, or maybe even self-centered. It's surprising that for many of us, maybe even all of us at some point or another, that it's hardest to consistently and unconditionally love the only person we will spend every minute of our lives with, from the first to the last, ourselves. It might even seem self-indulgent. After all, if we're worthy of being loved by others, won't that be enough? How much love does one person need anyway? Shouldn't we be trying harder to love ourselves? Rachel Macy Stafford is the author of Hands Free Life, Hands Free Mama, Only Love Today, and the new Live Love Now, all books sharing Rachel's powerful message of how learning self love is the inflection point for nearly every part of how we live our lives that brings us closer to or farther away from joy. Rachel's years of writing and research build on a single vital thesis, that being better, more loving people, whether it be parents, partners, friends, or citizens, must begin on a foundation of self-love. I hope you enjoy this conversation with Rachel Macy Stafford. This feels, well, it has been a long time coming for a variety of different reasons, scheduling, COVID, uh, one of them, but also I've been tracking with you and your work for years and years being the original hands-free, you know, mindful tech parent. So Mm. I'm thrilled to have this conversation. Same with me. Thank you so much. So your new book, Live Love Now, is about relieving the pressures we feel and finding real connection with our kids. In it, you tackle that six top stresses our young people face. One, feeling unseen and unheard. Two, experiencing rejection. Three, the allure and effect of technology usage. Four, lack of life skills, which I'm really interested to tackle a little bit with you today. Mm -hmm. Five, lack of coping skills. And finally, six, parental and academic pressure, which holy, we've experienced nothing like that uh, as we are right now. Yes. So you help parents discover how to embrace life and love now through acceptance, belonging, anchoring. I love that word so much. Independence, resilience, and worthiness. In your own words, what is live love now about and why does it matter so much in the moment we find ourselves in right now? Well, so it's easy to express I feel like words of love and maybe do acts of love. But what I'm talking about is living love, which gets kind of messy. It's, it's not often easy. It's, it's something that you have to work on and practice and you have to look at yourself. You have to look at, okay, so I'm responding to the people around me based on my own experiences. And so when we can begin to be aware of the choices that we're making um, to extend love to ourselves, then we begin to do a better job of realizing, so how do we love each other? How do we support each other? How do we accept each other for who they are? And that's when I think you really start to live a life of love when you can practice acceptance. You can kind of be the calm and the chaos. And because you're aware of your own emotions, your own feelings, your own experiences, and how that makes you respond to life circumstances. So it begins with ourselves. Yes. Yes. And that's not an easy place. But in my book, I talk about how the truth is not the end. The truth is the beginning. 
And so when you're willing to admit some painful truth and maybe realize, okay, this is a belief that I've been carrying since I've been a teenager or a young person. And I've carried this belief about my worth that's not just affecting me, but it's now it's affecting how I'm parenting. That's, that's a catalyst for growth. When you can take those inward looks and say, why do I feel so much pain around this? Or why do I want to control this situation so much? Or why is it so important that my child be this or that? Oh, it's me. This is my baggage, my issue. And once you can look at that, then you can make different choices. And then you don't have to then pass that on to your child. Yeah. Huge, 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 huge stuff. I don't know if it's um, middle age. I turned 40 this year, but I feel like, and COVID and all the things happening, I just feel like I'm going through this huge process personally right now of unlearning all kinds of beliefs and all kinds of uh, discerning between what is essential and non-essential. And so I feel like the heart Mm -hmm. of what you're talking about in this book is just like my heartbeat right now, just the stage I'm in. Um, You wrote a little bit about, and I piqued my interest, it actually posted on Instagram, um, that while the book is called Live Love Now, it was built from another phrase, which is still within reach. And I wanted you to tell us a bit about that phrase and why it holds so much meaning for you. So I wrote the whole book thinking it was going to be called Still Within Reach. And the main message was that we feel so far away oftentimes from the kids, the the young people, the teenagers who are growing up in a culture with things that we didn't have to face. So it can kind of feel like a foreign world. So I wanted them to know, one, our young people are still within reach. That gap is not too wide. But then there was a secondary part of it, which when I started realizing how much I was reflecting back on my own young person, the, the, the dreamer inside of me, that, that person that I was before the world told me, this is who you're supposed to be. I started getting in touch with her and I call her my dreamer girl because she was my most authentic self. It was the person who just did things because she wanted to do them. And she she knew what brought her joy and she knew it was okay to stop and take a breath. And so I also wanted people to know that part of us, our dreamer, our our inner child is also still within reach. And by being willing to be on this journey with our kids and say, hey, I don't know all the answers. I don't know how to navigate technology. I don't know how to navigate this high pressure world. But the minute that you say, I don't know, we'll figure this out together, you become a, a trusted confidant. Our, our kids know we don't know all the answers. It's better off if we just admit, I've never done this before. Let's figure it out together. And when I talked to so many kids in the classroom, that's what they said. I just want my parents to see me. I want them to hear me. I just want them to support me. They were not asking us to fix it, to do things for them. They just wanted to be acknowledged and be known. And that's how, back to living love, that's how we live love. It doesn't look like maybe what we thought it would be, like caring for someone, taking care of them, taking their pain away. No, this is, I'm with you. We don't know how this is going to go, but you're not alone. Take us deeper into the relationship between loving ourselves and loving others. I'm really curious to unpack that more deeply. And I just before you answer that, I want to share that I think that especially people that have grown up in particular religious streams, that this focus on self can be seen as sort of tainted. Like our our goal is to love others, right? Like we love God. If, yeah. You know, if you're if you're a worshiping of you know God person. You love God and you love others. That is your mandate. But there is this absolute vital link in the middle. So can you talk to us a bit about that? Yeah. Well, I learned the hard way from living that depleted, I'm giving, giving, giving all of me to everyone because that's how I thought I was worthy. 
That's what where my validation came from. And I'm living this completely depleted, maxed out life, giving of others to the point that I became this person I didn't even recognize. I acted in ways that I'm not proud of. I did self-destructive behaviors. Um, it was it took a moment where my daughter was reaching for a snack. She spilled a whole bag of rice. All of the grains hit the floor and I was about to just lose my you know what and I saw her face and she just had this look of fear. Mm. And I thought what have I become? Okay, so this is the result of depriving myself of sleep, depriving myself of my needs and my desires. Um, This is the result of paying attention to the outside and not working on the inside. That life of selflessness came at such a cost that I was actually hurting not just myself, but my children. And I thought, I don't want Natalie to grow up with this critical inner voice because that's that was the voice that pushed me. That voice is, you can't do that. that. That's selfish or this is not enough or you can't go out looking like that or you have no contribution to make. That inner bully, that voice is the opposite of self-love and it'll take your life if you let it. Yeah. And it'll take the people you love with it. And that was a wake up call for me. And I'm not saying that I got myself on track right away because when you've been going through decades and decades of talking to yourself like that and treating yourself like that, it takes work, it takes practice. But that was a catalyst. Mm -hmm. And I started saying a phrase, which you have heard because I have a book by the title, but only love today. I started talking back to my inner bully and I said, no. I'm not going there, only love today. And when I began to, it it started as a mantra, but then it became a way of being. And it was, it was easier to give my daughters the love and acceptance before I could give it to myself, which sometimes we hear, well, you've got to start with yourself, which is so true. But practically, in a practical way, I was able to realize if I talk to her that way, it's going to become her inner voice. And then I was able to see, I, I, vid, I could see tangibly the look on her face when I started not being so critical. And I thought, look, look at what that's doing to her now. When are you going to give yourself that? When are you going to tell yourself, it's okay to take a rest, Rachel? When are you going to say your worth is not determined by your checklist, how much you got done today. And this is, like I said, years and years of unlearning. As you mentioned that great word, unlearning. We're unlearning these damaging practices that we've been carrying and believing so that we don't pass them on. And I am not at all where I need to be, but I'm farther along than I was and I'm aware. And when I catch myself shaming myself or bullying myself, I don't take that as a time to say, oh, there you go again. I say, celebrate the awareness. Look what you just realized you were doing. And that's how I, I try to go through in the, in the book, you know, there's things that are going to make you feel uncomfortable and you're going to say, Ooh, I do that. I, I criticize, I control um, I, I numb by going to my phone, but what I try to say is that's not a moment to shame yourself. That's a moment to pat yourself on the back and say, I'm aware. Yeah. And awareness changes everything because then you can make a different choice. The Jomo cast is 100% listener supported. Each episode takes about 40 hours to create and involves the work of our composer and producer, Tom. Hello. Social media lead, Rebecca. Hello. And me. We believe there are new and even more urgent questions to be asked now about digital well-being, given that most of us will need to depend almost exclusively on digital channels for social support for the foreseeable future. 
On the podcast, we answer questions like, how can I stop comparing online and trust that I am enough? How do I shift my attention from passively consuming online to creatively connecting with neighbors and loved ones? How do I build the self-discipline to see things through? How do I stay on track doing the things I say I want to do without getting hijacked online? How do I make space for rest and play? How do I succeed in life without burning out? This podcast is made possible by you, our listeners all over the world, from Brazil to Australia, the USA to Singapore. Please support the JomoCast for just $3 a month. Visit patreon.com forward slash JomoCast and sign up today. You will get Jomo swag and a handwritten note of thanks from me in the mail, a shout out on the podcast and a place on the Jomo wall of thanks for all of time. You'll also have the opportunity to ask future guests your questions. To sign up, go to patreon.com forward slash JomoCast. That's P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com forward slash JomoCast. Thank you for supporting the content that supports you. Where I'd love to go is really practically, what are some steps that people can start to practice this live, love now philosophy? Just a couple of really practical steps. Well, sometimes people say, I don't even know where to start right. with finding my joy. It's, I don't even remember the last time I felt joy. And so sometimes I'll just say, you know, go back to your childhood. Look at a picture of yourself when you were little. What did that little person love to do? And I even say this to the teenagers. It's interesting. I'll go into the classrooms and I'll talk to them about my dreamer girl. I'll show them a picture and I'll say, you know, she was a notebook filler. She was an animal rescuer. She was a mixed tape maker. Those are all the things that I still love to do. And I got far away from, uh, you know, now I'm volunteering at a cat shelter. I go to concerts anytime, you know, not, not right now, but most of the time my joy is going with my husband to concerts. And I was depriving myself of that. You know, I spent 20, 30 years without writing and there was a hole in my heart because I wasn't writing. So I say, what did you do as a child that, that just made you feel at peace. You know, if you're out and you, sometimes I feel like we can be um, triggered in a way of like, we might go on a walk and we'll hear a stream and we'll say, oh, listen to that sound of running water. Why is that so soothing to me? For me, during the writing of Live Love Now, I happened to come upon a swing during a walk. I ended up every Wednesday going to that swing because swinging was my refuge as a little girl and I had forgotten. And that's what helped me write this book is I said every Wednesday, I'm going to go sit on that swing and I'm going to give myself that peace. So I think if we're going to be a role model for our teenagers today in this maxed out, distracted world, we have to show them what is our refuge? What do we do to fill ourselves up? And if we don't have a hobby, find one, find something, even if it's doing a puzzle. We started getting out puzzles over the last couple holidays. And it's so amazing how that can just take you out of your brain. And then you're focused on the pieces. And it's like, I call it puzzle piece, but it was (laughs) P-E-A-C-E, piece, you know, and so that's so important. Um, living love. Find things that fill you up, that fill your soul, even if it's just for a few minutes. Um, and then I also just love asking yourself, you know, how did I connect with each member of my family today? I make a point to have a connection time, and it may just be a few minutes but that's okay. There's no requirement. But I find that because I have teenagers, and it might be different for people with younger kids, but the invitation is such a powerful tool. 
our kids or even our partners aren't going to ask us to do things with them, but we can invite. And let's not assume they're going to always say yes, because they're not. That's not something to take personally, but invite them to do something with you. Invite them into your place of refuge, into your place of peace. And I know during the pandemic, we've been holed up together and I've been really aware just to watch the emotion, the emotions of my family. And there's one particular person who I know she can get really withdrawn when she doesn't have people around, which is opposite of me because I love to be alone and I can, I thrive on it. But one of my daughters is not that way. And so I kept inviting, let's do this. Let's do this. And it took four or five invitations over the series of four or five days. And she finally said yes to baking a cake with me. And it was a cake that I had made with my mom. And we got to talking about you know, that spurred talk of my childhood. And then she kind of started coming out of her shell. And then the next day, she invited me to do something with her. Mm. And so I, I try to talk about, you know, we're not always going to have family members say, hey, let's get together and do something. We have to be the one. We have to reach, you know, keep reaching. And it's so important now because we're not having our social needs met. And so anything that you can do to reach out to someone will also help you live love. Because I do think that when we can find someone that we can be real with, um, that was really instrumental in my own journey is finding that person who I could say, I feel like a failure. That, That was what I told her. I said, I feel like a failure today. And I'd never, ever said that to anyone. And she said, I feel that way a lot too. And I thought, what? You, you have it all together. You, you know, how can that be? And she said, Rachel, this, this is what happened. And then I said, well, this is what happened to me. And so I think living love is also finding a person that you can be authentic and vulnerable with. And then you don't feel so alone. Um, because if you try to hold up that facade all the time, every day, it's only going to cause deterioration and suffering inside. Mm -hmm. So those would be kind of off the top of my head. Those are the three things I feel like would be a great start. And you could, in things you could do right now, even in our restricted environment. I, I love it so much. I took, you probably saw me, I was scribbling down all the notes. Um, Imminently practical. I have to show you, um, you'll have to just imagine this listeners because you're not seeing video. Um, <laughs> I, have a, I have a photo of myself and I read recently in Glennon Doyle's um, Untamed that she, while she was writing that book, she had a photo of herself as a, as a little yes. girl um, with her all the time. And as you were talking about picturing yourself, I thought really practically get a picture of yourself. Mm -hmm. Get a picture of yourself when you were small and put it somewhere you can see it every day to remember. I love that your focus, at least what we're talking about today, the very practical examples you gave were about connecting to our own joy. Yeah, And there's probably really obvious reasons why, given the topic that I, I talk about. But um, it comes out of a philosophy of technology um, that I that basically undergirds all of the work that I do, which comes from a philosopher of technology out of Montana. Um, his name is Dr. Albert Borgman, and he writes about how for him, it's less about limiting our use of technology or screens. And even those definitions don't even really work anymore because yeah. everything is so much more blurred. And that's a bigger conversation. But he says his focus is less on limiting technology as it is on creating the positive conditions where other engagements, more joyful engagements, more enlivening engagements can thrive and flourish. So it's about creating the positive conditions. So if what you need to fill you up is baking, then make it very easy to bake with your family. If what you love to do is paint, then like let your messy paints be out with the easel on your front porch where everyone can see them so it's as easy as possible 
to set your hands to those things. I'm just like taking things off the top of my head. I love it. But make it as easy as possible to engage in those joys. And I think for our kids to see us filling ourselves up with those things. I wrote down this note from my son the other day. He's six years old. And he said he had, you know, it's their screen time for the day or whatever. And he's he's going out the door. I'm like, hey, Caleb, what are you what are you up to? He's like, friends are better than TV, mom. (laughs) That's just like that's his joy, right? Like that's where he gets filled up. He doesn't need. And so I think the focus on picturing yourself as a little kid, reconnecting to those joys is such a practical and powerful thing that we can do to be loved and to offer love because like you Mm -hmm. described with yourself that you are filled up enough to be an offering to your family. Yeah, that's beautiful. So good. You know, this is the Jomo cast and I'm curious to hear um, what the joy of missing out means to you. Well, I think the joy of missing out means you got to forge your own path and you got to listen to the priorities of your heart, not the priorities of the world, not the priorities of your neighbors. And it's, it's not an easy thing to do to go against really so much of what the culture tells us is this is where you find success. For instance, you know, if I had let society determine what was successful, I would not be where I am today. I I write with the goal of touching one life with each story that I write. It is the minute that the publisher starts pushing numbers at me, I feel triggered. I know that is not good for me. I know that numbers are not my friend because perfection is not my friend. And it is the enemy of creativity. It's the enemy of joy. And so I have to decide for myself, okay, what is important to me? Where do I feel like my place is in the world? And the more we can do that as adults, and we can say, I'm rejecting this definition, then this just, oh, talk about pressure relief off of our kids. And I have had many conversations with my daughters, especially as the one has gone through high school, where she got a grade and she questioned her worth. She went, she questioned her ability in the world. And I had to say, you know what? It may not feel like it, but there is a great big world outside of those classroom doors and walls and a place where your creativity your determination, your courage, like all these things that Natalie has that are not evaluated or measured at school. She's off the charts. And I said, there's a place where all of your gifts are going to be needed. And I remember that conversation as clear as day because I saw her just release this exhale. And it wasn't long before she started getting interested in uh, a learning trip to Africa. And filling out an application to go there. And I thought, you know, look at what this is doing. She's forging her own path, her own purpose discovery process that has nothing to do with the curriculum or the educational uh, systems. You know, they're, they're saying, these are the things you need to be doing. These are the things you need to have on your resume. And she's saying, this is where my heart is leading me. And that just researching to go on that trip did more for her confidence and her capableness than anything she'd ever done in any of her school years. And when she got there to the hillside of Rwanda and she started connecting with the children and the people there, she experienced joy truly for the first time. She is not a person who will get up and want, doesn't want the limelight. But the kids wanted her to show a game and she got up and she twirled around and she said, in that moment, I felt joy for the first time. And that changed my daughter forever. And she started asking different questions instead of what's going to look good on my resume to when's the last time I went to a scenic overview and just let myself stand there? 
When's the last time I locked eyes with a stranger? And those questions are in Live Love Now because they're so powerful. It's like, are we asking ourselves the right questions to uncover why are we here on this earth? What are we here to do? And as human beings, we are here to experience the joys of life and the joys of connecting with other human beings and the miracles. And if we choose society's path, we're going to miss out. And so the joy of missing out is really the joy of allowing yourself in to places that you wouldn't normally go if you go on the the beaten path. You got to you got to make your own path. That's right. Rachel, thank you so much for the incredible work that you do. I'm going to make sure to share all the links. But what is the best website for people to go to to find you and all of your awesome work? Oh, thank you so much. Uh, So Hands Free Mama, and I spell mama M-A-M-A, handsfreemama.com is where I still, um, I'm I'm one of those people who has not stopped blogging, even though blogging was so 10 years ago. But I'll still do a a nice blog post at least once a month, kind of, you know, sharing my journey. Because like I said, I'm not, I haven't uh, figured it all out. I'm still (laughs) learning and growing and healing. Um, So yeah, handsfreemama.com. And then the book is Live Love Now. And that's pretty much where all books are sold. Awesome. Thank you so much. One day we'll meet in person. It'll happen. I can't wait for that. (laughs) I would enjoy it so much. Thanks for listening. You can learn more about our guests in the show notes and by visiting jomocast.com. The JomoCast is edited and music composed by Thomas J. Inge. Visit Tom online at tinge, that's T-I-N-D-G-E dot com to learn more about Tom and his services. The JomoCast is listener supported. Sign up as a patron at patreon.com forward slash JomoCast. Patreon support makes the podcast possible. For just $3 a month, you will keep these conversations going. That link again is patreon.com forward slash JomoCast. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast with your provider of choice. And if you loved this episode, leave us a five-star review. These reviews are a powerful way you can help us reach more listeners. I'm your host, Christina Crook. Thanks for listening. And may you find joy missing out on the right things.